uh, we have an incredible second panel here uh, that is about the power to regulate. We have uh, Reva Siegel, who is a professor at Yale Law School, and her writing draws on legal history to explore questions of law and inequality and to analyze how courts interact with representative government and popular movements in interpreting the Constitution. Joseph Bloker is a professor of law at Duke Law School, where he writes and teaches about the Second Amendment, weapons regulations, and the freedom of speech. And Professor Bloker is also the co-director of our partner today, the Duke Center for Firearms Law. Nelson Lund is a professor at George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School. He has written widely in the field of constitutional law, including articles on constitutional interpretation, federalism, separation of powers, the Second Amendment, and other constitutional matters. Brandon Denning is a professor at Samford University's Cumberland School of Law. He writes about constitutional law, focusing on issues including judicial and executive branch appointments, the constitutional amendment process, foreign affairs, and of course, the Second Amendment. Jake Charles is a lecturing fellow and executive director of the Center for, Duke, uh, Center for Firearms Law at Duke, and he writes and teaches on the Second Amendment and firearms law. Lastly, moderating this, passel, moderating this panel is Abby Gluck, a professor at Yale Law School as well. She is an expert on Congress and the political process, federalism, civil procedure, and health law. She's also the chair emerita of the section on legislation and the law of the political process for the Association of American Law Schools. We're incredibly excited to have everyone here. Let me turn it over to you, Professor Gluck. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for this terrific symposium uh, and all the wonderful work that the Duke folks have been doing on gun violence for all these years. So thank you for pulling us together and thank you Northwestern for hosting us. Um, we have uh, four terrific presentations. Um, we're going to begin with uh, Riva and Joseph and then we're going to hear from Nelson, then we're going to hear from Brannon, and finally we're going to hear from Jake. And what's really terrific about these papers is that they're in amazing conversation with one another, uh, particularly in the order in which I've just laid them out. And so uh, we're looking forward to a great conversation. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Riva and Joseph. Uh, thanks so much, Abby, and thanks for the introductions, Elliot. Um, completely agree this is going to be an amazing conversation. We're thrilled to be part of the panel. Uh, so we're gonna try to keep our remarks brief um, and just give uh, sort of an outline of what we think is novel in our contribution um, to the Second Amendment scholarship, and then also say a bit about sort of the outlines of our argument and, and some of its implications. Uh, so let me start with the first of those, um, where we think we're sort of inserting ourselves into the scholarly conversation. Second Amendment scholarship has traditionally focused overwhelmingly and almost exclusively on questions involving the scope and strength of the right to keep and bear arms, rather than on sort of excavating and understanding and maybe thickening our understanding of the government's interest in regulating arms. And our project, in some sense, is to try to broaden the frame uh, and shift the focus to talk about um, the government's interest and the public interest in regulating guns and how that cashes out both inside and outside of courts. I think the dominant frame for talking about the government's interest in gun regulation uh, focuses on the prevention of physical harms, on the prevention of gun, uh, of gun wounding and gun, and gun death. And through that lens and in that framework, the paradigm scenes are familiar. They're places like Parkland and Sandy Hook and Aurora and the daily news of gun homicides and suicides across the country. But what concerns us is what falls outside that frame and what that lens fails to see. And that includes incidents where guns are used to intimidate, to threaten, to terrorize, even if no trigger is ever pulled, even if no bullet is ever shot. And the paradigm scenes in that framework uh, include as well um, incidents like armed demonstrators shouting at legislators in the Michigan State House or uh, citizens displaying guns at other citizens protesting outside their home, as we saw in St. Louis, or for that matter, the countless incidents that play out every day across the country where um, people use guns to coerce, intimidate, and terrorize intimate partners. The regulation of guns, we argue, properly concerns the ways that guns can intimidate and threaten, as well as the ways that they can wound and kill. And appreciating that, we think, helps focus attention on what should be the basic question in this debate, which is whether and how the enforcement of gun laws can secure public and private places for equal enjoyment by all citizens. 
I think that there's broad agreement that the government has an interest in regulating guns to protect the public safety, but some equate public safety with the prevention of physical injury. And in our paper, we show that public safety doesn't have to be and historically has not been defined in such narrow terms. It certainly includes the government's compelling government interest in preventing physical injury, um, but it also includes um, the preservation of public order, uh, building a community in which citizens, whether they are armed or unarmed, and however they may differ by race, sex, or viewpoint, uh, have an equal claim to security and the exercise of their liberties. To bring that focus, um, that definition of public safety into scholarship may be novel, but the conception itself is not new. Uh, for centuries, at least as far back as the Statute of Northampton, the Anglo-American common law tradition has recognized the government's power to regulate weapons, um, not only to keep members of the polity alive, um, but to protect the liberties of armed and unarmed citizens against weapons-related threats. Uh, and that long regulatory tradition has not only shaped state and federal law in various ways, but is at the foundation of the understanding of the Second Amendment set forth in District of Columbia versus Heller, where Justice Scalia specifically invokes it as a basis for reasoning about the regulation of guns. Uh, so I'm gonna pause there and turn it over to my co-author, Reva Siegel. Okay, thanks, Joseph. Um, so I'm gonna keep, uh, go the next step of setting out the arguments of our paper. So there's several reasons why it's especially urgent now to recover this common law approach to public safety. The main reason and the reason on which our paper focuses um, is that is this, that some have begun to treat the prevention of physical harm as a limiting principle, as the sole reason why government can regulate guns. For example, a small but growing number of judges have voted to strike down gun laws on the grounds that the government has not produced sufficient evidence that challenged laws reduce gun injuries and death. This demand for a fit in the form of empirical proof that gun regulation prevents physical harm is at odds with most case law and compelling interests that courts, um, uh, they regularly allow government to burden constitutional rights in the pursuit of what they recognize as compelling ends which cannot be empirically proved. For example, expressing respect for the dignity of human life or showing students the path to leadership is visibly open to talented and qualified individuals of every race and ethnicity. Another setting in which we see growing appeals to restrictive accounts of public safety um, is when advocates argue that restrictions on public carry can be enacted only to prevent physical injury and not to protect the public's confidence in inhabiting various domains of our shared life, whether to attend school shop or listen to a concert gathered for prayer or to assemble in debate or to vote. If we do not recognize both the physical and social dimensions of public safety, then we're going to fail to take account of the many constitutional dimensions of the gun debate. The under enforcement or selective enforcement of gun laws can imperil freedom of speech and freedom of religion or the ability to vote and the equal freedom to do so. Whether or not citizens are armed or however they may differ by race, sex or viewpoint. Since we began work on this paper in the wake of the open carry protests that shut down the Michigan legislature. And as we learned yesterday, the plots to kidnap and even by some to kill Governor Whitmer. The reasons for recovering the common law's approach to public safety have grown even beyond those we discuss in the paper. There are now growing calls for the expansion of public carry in light of the protests of 2020, or specifically with reference to the protests of 2020, on the ground that we live in what one of our panelists calls a time of lawless violence. That's Nelson's paper, which we'll be hearing about shortly. Or David Bernstein calls a time of law enforcement abdication on a paper that's up on SSRN. We reject this approach to the regulation of guns on the understanding that our democracy is plainly in trouble, but as yesterday's news on the militia plots against Governor Whitmer illustrate, our constitutional democracy is in exponentially more trouble where we resolve differences by resort to arms. We do not believe we're living in a state that is so failed 
that courts must heed President Trump's call to liberate Michigan and shut down democratic debate, whether over public health measures or guns, Precisely because willingness to resort to politically motivated violence is on the rise, we need to support, not undermine, public institutions where we can voice differences without resort to force. We argue that in the first instance is for democratic institutions to decide how to protect public peace and order. Even if the Supreme Court extends Heller to cover public carry in various settings, which we can discuss, the court would still have to address the nature of the government's interest in regulating guns that threaten public peace and the security of other citizens. As we show in Heller, Justice Scalia specifically invokes the statute of Northampton as a basis for reasoning about laws that burden the right that Heller recognized. In that long-running common law tradition imported to the United States, government has power not only to prevent physical harm, but also to prevent weapons carrying to the terror of the people. What counts as terror and whose terror counts have changed over the centuries, and certainly there will be disputes about whether certain facts count constitute intimidation. But we argue government has democratic authority to enact laws that preserve public peace and order and to protect citizens from gun threats, whose premises are deeply rooted in the very law which Justice Scalia grounded Heller. So to close up, in these terribly troubled times, Americans of very different views have reason to be afraid. Some look to guns, other look to government to establish the minimum of security so that we can live together and exercise fundamental constitutional rights. The question of how to address our differences and find common ground, if any exists, is through democracy, we argue. We cannot resolve all of our problems by courts or by guns. History offers us some guidance. If we do not recognize the ancient role that weapons laws play in securing the peace and public order, we will allow the use of guns to define our constitutional democracy rather than the other way around. Thank you, Joe and Riva. Um, we now look forward to hearing a robust response from Madison. Well, I don't know if it's gonna be all that robust, but uh, I will have a response. Uh, thanks to everyone who helped organize the symposium. Uh, I'm certainly honored to have been invited to participate. Um, Joseph and Riva have focused attention on an underappreciated dimension of the debate about the constitutional right to keep and bear arms. They reject a narrow concept of public safety that evaluates regulations without full consideration of what is uh, encompassed in that concept. Freedom from intimidation, for example, not just physical pain. At this level of generality, I agree with them. But I do not agree that an appropriately broad conception of the public interest should widen the discretion of legislatures to impose restrictions on firearms. The questions they raise are especially important during this time of politically inspired riots and flaccid government responses to mob violence. The most practically important Second Amendment issue that's ripe for Supreme Court resolution concerns the scope of the constitutional right to bear arms in public. The Constitution's text and history offer little direct guidance about the exact scope of that right. For that reason, the justices will inevitably have to decide how to resolve the conflicts of interest that occur when governments seek to promote public safety by depriving individuals of the means to protect themselves. In performing this obligation, the court should give no weight to fears of an armed citizenry which frequently inspire useless or counterproductive infringements on individual liberty. Nor should regulations enjoy a presumption of constitutionality merely because they may provoke, promote a net reduction in deaths and physical injuries. The deepest principles on which our legal and constitutional institutions rest, which are reflected in the Second Amendment, are at odds with this kind of narrow cost-benefit calculation. The political theory that underlies the Second Amendment can be traced back to John Locke. He argued that in the state of nature, reason dictates a natural law that includes a duty to refrain from harming the life, liberty, or property of other people. Reason also dictates a correlative right to enforce that natural law by punishing those who offend against it. William Blackstone, 
the preeminent authority on English law for the generation of Americans who adopted the Second Amendment, shows that our legal tradition reflects basic Lockean principles. He stressed that when one's person or property is forcibly attacked, nature itself prompts an immediate violent response because the future process of law may not offer an adequate remedy. For that reason, he said, self-defense is justly called the primary law of nature and it cannot be taken away by the law of society. Blackstone's role in our tradition is especially important because he linked this primary law of nature with the right to keep and bear arms, which he put among the indispensable rights which serve, he said, principally as barriers to protect and maintain inviolate the three great and primary rights of personal security, personal liberty, and private property. The right to arms, he said, is rooted in the natural right of resistance and self-preservation when the sanctions of society and laws are found insufficient to restrain the violence of oppression. Blackstone made no distinction between the violence of oppression that results from government's failure to control criminals, including politically motivated rioters, and the oppression that government itself may undertake. The right to keep and bear arms and to use them when appropriate is a vital element of the liberal order that our founders handed down to us. They understood that those who hold political power will always be tempted to reduce the freedom of those they rule, and that many of the ruled will be tempted to trade their liberty for promises of security. Those temptations are apt to be especially alluring when widespread criminal violence threatens both liberty and security. They may be even more alluring when such violence takes the form of sustained and repeated mob violence that reflects a serious breakdown of the social fabric. And that, of course, is exactly what we've been seeing all over the country this past summer. The causes of these temptations are sown in the nature of man. Our Constitution, including the Second Amendment, is a device designed to frustrate the domineering tendencies of the politically ambitious. The Second Amendment also plays an important role in fostering the kind of civic virtue that resists the cowardly urge to trade liberty for an illusion of safety. Armed citizens take responsibility for their own security, thereby exhibiting and cultivating the self-reliance and vigorous spirit that is ultimately indispensable for genuine self-government. Our rulers include the judges charged with protecting our Second Amendment rights, and they are subject to the same temptations as other government officials. As they develop the nascent jurisprudence of this recently rediscovered constitutional provision, they have an opportunity to show that they understand how a robust right to keep and bear arms serves both individual freedom and civic virtue. If they fail to do that, they will help the nation take a significant step toward the soft despotism to which Tocqueville feared we would succumb. He described what he foresaw as a government of immense and tutelary power, presiding over a mass of self-absorbed individuals. This power, he said, is absolute, detailed, regular, far-seeing, and mild. It would resemble paternal power if, like that power, it had for its object preparing men for manhood, but it only seeks on the contrary to keep them fixed irrevocably in childhood. It likes citizens to enjoy themselves, provided that they think only of enjoying themselves. It willingly works for their happiness, but it wants to be the unique agent and sole arbiter of that happiness. It provides for their security, foresees and provides for their needs, facilitates their pleasures, conducts their principal affairs, directs their industry, regulates their estates, divides their inheritances. Can it not take away from them entirely the trouble of thinking and the pain of living? Tocqueville wrote those words almost two centuries ago. There are powerful political forces pushing us in this direction, much more so than there were in his time, but we haven't yet succumbed. The spirit of the Second Amendment is one of the things that has kept the government from fixing us irrevocably in childhood. 
when they interpret the Second Amendment, our judges should honor that spirit by recognizing the full value of the right to arms, just as they routinely recognize the full value of the rights protected by the First Amendment. The exercise of all these constitutional rights frequently makes some people very uncomfortable. But even if they are in the majority, as they frequently are, their comfort is less important than the freedom of those whom our Constitution insists should be treated as adults. Thank you, Nelson. Um, we will now hear from Brennan. Good morning. Uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, say thanks to uh, Jake, Joseph, and Daryl for the invitation to participate, and, and thank you, Abby, for, for moderating this panel. Um, and, uh, and thanks to Northwestern for uh, finding a home for all these papers. Um, so, uh, 20 years ago, um, over 20 years ago, before Heller was uh, decided, I, I did a sort of thought experiment uh, in writing about the Second Amendment as an under-enforced constitutional right. And one of the suggestions that I had uh, sprung from a recent Supreme Court case at the time called Bernie versus Flores, uh, which addressed con uh, Congress's uh, ability to enforce the 14th Amendment through its uh, Section 5 power. And Bernie had, had made the distinction, they said, uh, with regard to the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, uh, you, Congress's Section 5 power doesn't run to uh, altering the substance of a constitutional right, but it, it can uh, enforce it and even maybe go to uh, take prophylactic measures. And, and nobody quite knew and said, well, it has to, any remedy that, that Congress proposes uh, through that 14th Amendment has to be congruent and proportional. And nobody had any idea of what that meant. And so I played around with it in this article and suggested that uh, one remedy for the, the judiciary's, uh, at the time, lack of interest in enforcing the Second Amendment was maybe to go to Congress. Well, now here we are in, in 2020, uh, 12 years after Heller, uh, 10 years after McDonnell, and uh, there are complaints that uh, the courts, uh, the Supreme Court in particular, uh, treats the Second Amendment as a second class right. Justice Thomas has uh, taken to uh, regularly dissenting from uh, denials of certiorari in Second Amendment cases to complain at length about how the court treats the Second Amendment uh, differently than other rights. Uh, we're beginning to hear reports that, uh, that you know, the, the wobbly person on the court is, is Ju Chief Justice Roberts that he is not a fan. And, and, you know, one report was that in the New York rifle and pistol case, he actually went and told some of his uh, colleagues that, that he wasn't inclined to rule in favor of the Second Amendment. So given that, and given the fact that since 1997, we've had uh, almost uh, 10 cases sort of spelling out what congruence and proportionality means uh, in in the Section 5 uh, space uh, caused me to want to revisit my earlier idea and see if, if, um, see if there's something there. If, if the judiciary is being unresponsive, if it's not, uh, if it's treating the, the Second Amendment as a second-class right, as Justice Thomas alleges, um, and if there are few prospects for uh, that to change in the near future, then what can we do? And the, the answer is maybe go to Congress. Um, and what we've learned in the years since, uh, since Bernie versus Flores is that uh, congruence and proportionality requires Congress to assemble some kind of record, uh, some kind of record that demonstrates that there is a persistence of at least a possible constitutional violations of a right that the court itself has recognized uh, to require something more than a rational basis standard. And if it does that, then Congress can not only address 
the constitutional violations, but it also can enact prophylactic measures that might go beyond what the court itself would require uh, in a given case. And uh, it seems to me that uh, on my reading of the cases, that Congress would have a great deal of space to enact some kind of remedy, uh, even going so far as to abrogate state sovereign immunity and make states liable for money damages for the infringement of the right to keep and bear arms. Uh, I think that it could, that Congress could strengthen its case not only because uh, I think as the lower courts have demonstrated, intermediate scrutiny is the standard of review. Uh, so there already we have a heightened standard of review. And the record that Congress would have to compile on my reading of the cases uh, is sort of in inverse proportion to, um, to the level of scrutiny that the court applies. So in cases in which um, alleged violations or classifications are judged on a rational basis standard. Um, you know, the court is very skeptical of, of attempts to uh, abrogate state sovereign immunity, um, you know, uh, without accumulating a lot of evidence of some kind of uh, uh, discrimination or um, illicit classification. But with, uh, with the Second Amendment already being subject to a high standard review, I think that burden would be reduced. Second, uh, the court uh, often refers to the record assembled uh, by Congress accompanying the Voting Rights Act of 1965 as sort of a gold standard. And then I think that you could easily, and that it was limited, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, there were only a few states that required preclearance for certain things. and. And so I think Congress could do this as well. Um, it could limit the remedy to um, uh, maybe certain types of regulation, uh, you know, assault weapons bans, uh, uh, shall care, uh, or may carry uh, concealed carry provisions. It could limit it to certain states, maybe the state are most um, uh, likely to uh, limit the rights of, of uh, of gun owners. And um, I think keeping with that precedent and keeping, um, uh, you know, trying to mirror or mimic uh, the way the 65 uh, Vetting Rights Act record was compiled would be something that, uh, you know, Congress could very easily do. Now, you know, I'll say something. I mean, is, is this just sort of purely a thought experiment? Uh, perhaps. Um, if, as the polls sort of indicate, uh, the Democrats are poised to run the tables in November, uh, the likelihood of this ever coming to pass is, is very small, except, <clears throat> except that I note that uh, with the civil unrest, um, gun sales have gone up. Not only that, but a number of people who are uh, new gun owners are first time gun owners. And uh, I mean, just this is anecdata, but a, a good friend of mine, a lawyer who's never owned a gun, he and his wife are uh, politically quite liberal. And in the wake of the civil unrest, both of them have uh, gone out and purchased guns and are training to learn how to use them. And so I think as the, you know, even in, in blue states and blue cities, whatever, um, as you get this uh, sort of not only defund the police rhetoric, but also you get uh, police um, being reluctant to act uh, for fear of, of triggering further uh, civil unrest. I think that, that more and more people are sort of, uh, um, you know, wanting to, exercise at least uh, in the spirit of the second amendment the idea that you know government in our country at least does not have a monopoly on the instruments of violence and uh, are willing to take responsibility for the safety of themselves and their family and so I i'm not sure that that dynamic isn't a little ideologically cross-cutting and so something very much like this legislative remedy uh, uh, in the wake of uh, 
what appears to be judicial reluctance to uh, fully enforce the Second Amendment, uh, you know, might have traction regardless. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we are now going to hear from our last presenter before we move to Q&A, and that's Jake Charles. Abby. In deciding constitutional challenges, we care about government motive in various settings. Uh, purpose to further religion is impermissible. The intent to stifle speech because of its viewpoint is improper. And the desire to place a burden in the path of a woman's right to choose is out of bounds. And the Supreme Court has also made clear that another government purpose is entirely illegitimate, a bare desire to harm. In other words, the state's expression of animus. Animus doctrine arose in the equal protection space and has led the court to strike down laws based on animus toward hippies, intellectually disabled individuals, and members of the LGBT community. In these contexts, even though the group may not be a suspect or quasi-suspect class, the government's animus cannot serve as a legitimate interest to uphold legislation. The court has also wrestled with animus concerns in recent cases about the DACA program and outside the equal protection context in Masterpiece Cake Shop with the Free Exercise Clause and Trump versus Hawaii with the Establishment Clause. One common thread in the animus case law is that mere hostility toward people or their beliefs is not a permissible basis for government action. That brings us to the Second Amendment. In burgeoning Second Amendment advocacy and scholarship, one hears increasing concerns from gun rights proponents about legislative and judicial hostility. This kind of animus claim comes in at least three varieties, animus against gun owners, animus against gun rights, and animus against guns. I'll first separate out these types of claims with some examples and then turn to assessing what bearing they ought to have on Second Amendment doctrine. The first type of claim sounds in traditional animus language. Some activists and advocates argue that gun owners are treated as second class. Consider, for example, the statement of a gun store owner who sued and partially prevailed over a COVID-related shutdown order. Quote, we are being treated like second class citizens because we sell guns. Some commentators similarly argue that gun owners have been subjected to vicious stereotypes and are, in this sense, no different than other groups going to court to protect their rights. Some advocates have expressly linked uh, the connection between Black Americans during the Civil Rights era and gun owners today. And fictional West Wing character Ainsley Hayes best exemplifies this view when she criticized the Bartlett administration's gun control plan. Your gun control position, she said, doesn't have anything to do with public safety, and it's certainly not about personal freedom. It's about you don't like the people who do like guns. You don't like the people. Next, there are claims about animus against the Second Amendment right, claims of hostility toward the constitutional guarantee itself. These concerns of the Second Amendment is being treated as a second-class right, in the words of Justice Thomas, are becoming increasingly common. Consider a recent dissenting opinion from a Ninth Circuit judge, which well shows why these types of claims are best characterized in concerns about animus. To the rational observer, Judge Van Dyke said, it is apparent that our court just doesn't like the Second Amendment very much. We always uphold restrictions on the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. Show me a burden, any burden on the Second Amendment, and this court will find a way to uphold it. There exists on our court a clear bias, a real prejudice against the Second Amendment and those appealing to it. Just as judges level these claims against the Second Amendment's perceived opponents, so do some advocates, commentators, and politicians. Some argue that the Democratic Party is increasingly hostile to the Second Amendment. Others that particular localities like California, New York, or Virginia are. And finally, we have claims that gun regulation is motivated by an irrational hostility toward guns themselves. Describing lawmakers as hoplophobic, afraid of guns, advocates argue that laws passed on this basis can't stand. As Fifth Circuit Judge James Ho put it, constitutional rights must not give way to hoplophobia. These three kinds of animus claims are becoming increasingly pervasive in gun rights quarters. As lower courts sketch out the bounds of Heller and gun rights proponents see fewer victories than they imagined they would, claims about mere hostility become endemic in Second Amendment advocacy are in, and are increasingly seeping into judicial opinions. I argue that courts should not import any kind of bad motive test into the Second Amendment. They ought to treat these claims as rhetorical tools to expand gun rights. First, as both a descriptive and normative matter, gun legislation does not evince an animus against gun owners. Descriptively, animus just doesn't explain gun legislation. Gun laws are motivated by the quintessential public interest, 
the protection of public peace and safety. The rationale for the constitutional significance of animus, on the other hand, is that bare group-based harm infliction is never a legitimate government purpose. As William Ariza observes, the roots of this rationale can be traced back to the founding generation's concerns over faction and the Supreme Court's later interest in invalidating class legislation. The key problems with those types of lawmaking is that legislators were concerned about vindicating private or factional interests and not public ones. But because gun laws are motivated by, motivated by the central concerns of all government, they do not rest on mere hostility. They are not grounded on status or identity and don't rely on stereotypes or prejudice. Gun owners have no immutable or even identifiable characteristics that gun laws target. Normatively, legislation aimed at hippies or the intellectually disabled or LGBTQ individuals raise concerns about animus both because of the history confronting those groups and because of the expressive harms that legislative hostility brings about. Neither is true with respect to gun owners. There's no comparable history of government disfavoring gun owners. In fact, there's nearly the exact opposite. Nor are there concerning expressive effects that might attend such a history of mistreatment. No stigmatizing stamp of disapproval accompanies legislation imposing background checks on private sales or banning certain types of semi-automatic weapons. Next, in trying to unpack what effect animus against a right should have, we need to step back and consider why we care about purpose scrutiny in constitutional law at all. What role should bad motives play in constitutional rights adjudication? Richard Fallon, for example, has argued that we ought to be a lot less concerned with what he calls constitutionally forbidden legislative intent. Instead, substantive doctrines should play the key role, focusing on a law's language and effects. Calvin Massey similarly argues that government motives should play only a circumscribed role because it is the real world effects of government action that harm or help people, he says, the default criterion should be assessing the constitutional validity of a law by its effects. These calls have particular force, I'd argue, in the context of claims about animus against rights. And here I'm echoing a point Rick Hassan has made when rejecting a focus on bad intent uh, tests in election cases. In these situations, we are even less concerned with the stigmatic or expressive harms than when government acts to harm people. We ought to focus on the effects of the law, whether and how it burdens one's right to use a firearm in self-defense, not with the whether the regulations evince improper motives. To be sure, lawmakers have deliberative obligations and mere hostility to a guaranteed right is never a legitimate reason for decision. To echo Judge Posner's comments in reviewing an abortion regulation, Quote, if statute burdens constitutional rights and all that can be said on its behalf is that it is the vehicle that legislators have chosen for expressing their hostility to those rights, the burden is undue. In the same way, a bare desire to infringe gun rights would be improper. But for the reasons laid out with respect to gun owner animus, gun laws do not arise from mere hostility toward the right, but from solicitude toward the public peace. They might go too far in that aim and thus be unconstitutional, but that conclusion should derive from a focus on the law's impact and not its provenance. Finally, on the point of animus against guns, my view is that even were some legislat legislators overly fearful of guns, nothing constitutionally meaningful would follow from it. The history of gun regulations have long recognized that certain firearms, those deemed dangerous and unusual, or certain types of carrying or bearing them can legitimately cause, quote, terror that the government can take into account in regulating. Absent an effect on gun owners or gun rights, a legislature's distaste for a constitutional commodity shouldn't have any role in the doctrinal analysis. A more productive gun debate requires recognition that both sides seek the same important ends. Fewer gun deaths, fewer injuries, and other gun-related harms. We might disagree about the means to those ends, but an effective public discourse isn't furthered by trying to sort people into either gun nut or hopplephobe. And constitutional doctrine identifying and protecting the rights of gun owners and users shouldn't incorporate a bad motive test that would at best be useless and at most and at worst be a tool for judges to import their policy preferences. Instead, whether a gun law is constitutional ought to focus on traditional questions about history, burdens, tailoring, and the like. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, I am going to, uh, let me just make sure I'm up here now, uh, I'm going to start by throwing out a question uh, to our panelists. I'm going to actually ask a question to them in pairs because I think the papers go so beautifully together. Um, and then we'll start going through the chat. So I'm going to start with a question for the first three, for Riva, Joseph, and Nelson. 
And I'm going to phrase my question generally and then sort of specifically to each. So my general question to you three is, you know, is this debate over interests really useful in the sense that you're both talking about different sets of interests uh, as, a reason for, as a reason for regulating or not? And my basic question is, how are we going to move past this uh, or reconcile this if we have these different and conflicting interests? And I have a more specific question that I, I want to ask Nelson, which is listening to your presentation, I couldn't help but wondering how you feel about criminal law, like basic criminal law, because, you know, the extreme version of your argument might also be read to say that basic criminal law is just the same kind of sort of uh, totalitarian government overreach that we'd be worried about. And I would love to hear your response to that. Uh, Riva and Joseph, I would love to hear your response to how your broader conceptualization of the interest would change the cases or would it change the way we talk about gun violence or would it actually sort of change, how would it actually change cases on the ground? So I leave, I want to throw that out and give you a chance to say a little more uh, before we move on to the others. So you, uh, who would like to start with that? Nelson, great. Uh, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to give that signal, but if oh, you know, I saw you do this. No, that, that's that's fine. Um, so, is the debate useful? Um, uh, I don't know uh, if the debate is useful. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, it, it seems to me that 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 people just come to this debate with a lot of pre-existing uh, opinions about questions that are at the level of generality that this discussion has been about and whether they can be persuaded to change their positions, I don't, I don't know. It, it may just be that they can't be. Um, I think once the debate starts, it's useful for both sides to be heard, um, which is part of the reason I decided to, uh, to respond to Riva and Joseph's paper. Uh, but whether, whether it will turn out to be useful or not, I, I don't know. I think there is something to be said uh, for encouraging judges uh, to try to get past their own prejudices or preconceived ideas about these things. Um, and so maybe there's some hope uh, of, of people on both sides of that question uh, thinking more uh, about these if, if, if these kinds of issues are ventilated to them uh, in, uh, uh, in briefs, particularly in cases. Uh, law review articles, I'm not so sure. Uh, I'm inclined to think that law clerks go and look uh, in there for things they can use in the opinion uh, without uh, the law review articles having much influence on the judges, uh, but there's probably exceptions to that. Um, now on the question of the criminal law, I, I, I'm not opposed to the criminal law. Um, I think it is, I do think it's possible for the criminal law to be used inappropriately um, and to unnecessarily uh, undermine constitutional rights and interests and rights that are not constitutional, uh, but but that that should that should people should be left alone. Um, so overcriminalization, I think, is certainly a possibility. I think it occurs uh, in some places. Um, has 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 occurred in our country uh, uh, and recently. I, I think that can happen. I'm not opposed to criminal law. Um, let me give let me give an example um, of. Uh, of where I think the criminal law is appropriate and can be misused, and that's brandishing statutes, um, like the one that's apparently being used in the St. Louis case. Um, I have no objection to uh, the traditional brandishing statutes that, that forbid people to, uh, uh, to display firearms or other weapons in a, in a manner that's meant to uh, uh, unlawfully or tortiously uh, uh, intimidate other people. I have no objection to that. I would have objection to brandishing statutes that were that were uh, drafted or enforced so broadly that it undermines the Second Amendment right to uh, bear weapons in public. Nelson, we just got a follow-up question. If you don't mind, I just want to throw it in, Go which is about uh, gun, guns at the election sites. In light of that brandishing question. So what if there's a law that says, you know, we really don't want people bringing guns to voting places? Yeah, I, 
at that level, at that level of generality, uh, I, I think it, it's, it's a very dangerous thing. It's a very dangerous thing for the courts to accept the proposition that merely bearing uh, a weapon is itself intimidating. Uh, it should be prohibited, uh, should pr be prohibited legally. So I would think that my, my own opinion is that any such laws should be drafted uh, 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 much, much more narrowly, um, and they should be written in such a way that if people actually do try to intimidate other people at polling places, uh, they can be prosecuted. Um, I, I imagine that can happen. I've seen stories in the press over the years that suggest that it has happened in some places, um, and I think that should, if it, if it really happens, it should be punishable and should be prosecuted. Uh, but I, again, I I, I, I'm skeptical about very broadly worded statutes, gun-free zones, that creating gun-free zones at some distance around polling places. Um, I'm skeptical of that. I think the gun-free zone, the history of gun-free zones has not been, uh, not been a, a, a happy one. Right, that's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, Reva Joseph? Sure, a few a few quick thoughts um, in response. First to yours, um, Abby, about you know how which cases and how might they come out differently um, if if courts were to read and be convinced by uh, uh, the arguments that Reva and I are making. Um, it's possible to identify some, um, and I think it's sort of a rising tide. I'll, I'll pick just one example, which may be familiar to those in the field. Uh, uh, early after Heller, the, the Fourth Circuit decided a case called the United States versus Chester, which involved the constitutionality of um, USC 922G9, which prohibits those convicted of domestic violence crimes from possessing firearms. Second Amendment challenge against that provision, and the court ends up not striking the law down, but remanding on the basis that the government had not shown sufficient evidence that that prohibitor prevents violence. And in other words, they were blinded to the sort of broader interests in preventing coercive control in intimate situations, which I think might have actually moved the needle in a case like that. Now, again, that law is never struck down, but it's that sort of at the, at the sort of boundaries um, where I think our argument might have the most, the most purchase. Um, to the questions of sort of conflicting interests and the degree to which um, Reva and I disagree with um, Nelson, um, a, few, a few quick thoughts, partly responding to the paper and partly responding to Nelson's comments. I guess first, just to emphasize what I take to be a lot of shared ground here, a lot of common ground. Um, I think that we agree that historical analysis alone is not going to resolve all the hard questions for the Second Amendment. There's going to have to be some consideration of interests. Um, I think, you know, we're in agreement that well properly done, interest-based analysis can vindicate the right and the government's interest, the public's interest in regulation. I think we agree that the interests go beyond just physical harm and casualties, that there's other things at stake besides sort of bodies and bullets. Um, and I'm sort of determined to find more common ground. So I just want to suggest two things um, that Nelson said, which I, maybe we disagree about, maybe we agree on. So, so one was, Nelson, you repeatedly refused to the sort of referred to the sort of illusion of safety, um, and I want to I want to push back on that a little bit because I'm not sure that we disagree as sharply as maybe it sounds there. I think we're not the the, the motivation for the paper is not to pr protect preserve the constitutionality of gun laws which threaten people's actual physical safety, laws that are actually counterproductive. Um, I think that. You know, there is good empirical evidence that some gun laws do save lives, um, but in a wide range of cases, as you've written about and you know, like the evidence is contested on both sides. It's not clear as one would want, whether you're an advocate of regulation or opponent of regulation, that the gun laws, you know, actually do save people from being shot. And in those situations where the empirics are contested, it strikes me that the arguments on both sides are arguments from sort of fear and perceptions of safety or what you called an illusion of safety, right? So expanding public carry too might undermine people's safety, but advocates who make that broad argument, I think are invoking almost the sort of flip side, I mean, it's the same interest that, that Riva and I are talking about. And then secondly, the word, um, you know, comfort, um, you know, which is not, it's not the word that, that we're using. We're not, we're not trying to constitutionalize comfort uh, as such to say that that can override, you know, other people's constitutional interests. But, but I would say it's not 
anomalous to uphold restrictions on constitutional rights in the, names of, in the name of interests other than physical safety. And we do see that in lots of other areas of constitutional law, um, you know, whether it's abortion restrictions passed in the interests of vindicating the dignity of human life, even if it doesn't lessen the number of abortions, um, you know, campaign contribution restrictions. We give an example in the paper of the Chief Justice's opinion in a case called williams Uly, which upholds, even under strict scrutiny, um, a campaign rest a restriction on campaign contributions to judicial campaigns. And the Chief Justice says, I'll just read this and then I'll, I'll quote, the concept of public confidence and judicial integrity does not easily reduce to precise definition, nor does it lend itself to proof by documentary record, nonetheless support sufficient to support the law. What we're trying to say is, if it works for judicial elections, why not also for pla like polling places and some of the others that, that Abby asked about? I'll stop there. Um, so I, I wanted to, I started to speak before, but I was muted, so, but this, this will work. I wanted to um, come back on um, Nelson's uh, point about the brandishing law, um, which he um, thoughtfully suggested that um, he thought was a reasonable uh, restriction on uh, gun use. Um, and to, to sort of work with that for a second. So there you have a case where someone, um, or someone's plural, if we take our Michigan example, Michigan legislature example, uh, may have a weapon which they've not discharged um, in such a way as to injure someone, but they're carrying it in such a way as to uh, dramatically alter that person's uh, freedom, their liberty. Um, and you know, it's not even a case in which they're actually um, extracting some, uh, using it to extract some concession from them, requiring them to sign a contract or to for, for, forego some other um, uh, good or freedom, uh, but they're just impinging on uh, their well-being and freedom um, in ways that may have consequences to the exercise of other constitutional rights as they did in Michigan. Um, but the question is, uh, why should, if we recognize it in the case of a, a case of brandishing, once we understand that intimidation can, can that guns can have those effects on people, why restrict it to the case in which a gun is held in that particular way, once we see that people's ability to move and exercise constitutional liberties can be affected by the use and presence of guns in their lives. And what our paper is doing is noticing that the enforcement of gun laws do have those consequences, even when enforcement or non-enforcement of gun laws do have those consequences, even when a gun is not pointed in someone's face or, or whatever else the brandishing case. So when we got to the example of a gun-free polling place law, which um, Joseph and I have um, toyed with as a possible example, as we discovered that very few such laws exist, very few jurisdictions have laws of this kind and have fact-dependent restrictions on the use of firearms in polling places, you know, the person's chance to vote is already gone by the time they've litigated this fact-dependent question about whether the gun has been held in such a way as to impinge on their freedom to vote because someone who's um, by reason of race or class or otherwise um, feeling at risk in approaching that polling place is not going to wait around to find out whether or not they're free to vote or not to vote under those circumstances if they're not armed and approach. So their right has already been impinged upon and probably doesn't have the ability to get representation or otherwise. So we just note that in this constitution, there's more than just a second amendment. Other rights may be implicated by uh, the possession of a gun. So prophylactically, someone may conclude better, a democracy may, a polity may, I don't say all, all jurisdictions, but a state or a locality might conclude that all things considered, given either friction, polarization, experience, that it may be better just simply to create a space where people can approach polling places without fear or without needing to dispute the way in which a gun was held to get into an argument or get retain counsel or something like that. And we could get into an argument about how these things are to be balanced, but the question is, who's to decide that question? A democracy or a court here? And it, what's a, a problem with the physical harm only approach to this question is, we only see one constitutional right. 
And there are multiple constitutional rights here. Um, and so at least one piece of this account is to make us notice the multiple of them and also to invite us to ask the question of where does this all get decided? And also, even when it's getting decided in a court, to give due weight to the deliberation of the democratic body in doing the question of, 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 of um, uh, weighing or the, the question of fit. So in the end, it may well be in court, but it should be in a court in a way that respects the role of democratic prerogatives and to respect them in a way that's not speaking. And I wanna to get to my last point here um, with the deliberative body addressing the regulator as a bunch of cowards because your discourse treats those who look to the regulation of guns as persons acting out of cowardice and those who pull guns as those who are acting out of virtue. And I do want to say that that is a subject that requires a deeper conversation than I'm afraid my time is going to allow here. But I will say that I observe that there are fears on both sides of this conversation and you're elevating pulling a gun as the McCloskeys did against the Black Lives Matters protesters as virtue here and the others as cowardice. And that's a much, much, much longer conversation than I'm afraid I can take the time to answer right now. Great. I think just for what it's worth, I think the multiple constitutional rights framing is a very helpful way to illuminate what you and Joseph are doing. That's very clarifying. Um, so let me ask um, Jake and Brandon a brief question and we'll get to our our lively chat and don't be shy to join the chat. Um, I want to ask you, is there a way to think about what Brandon described as a growing momentum of animus um, as something different, like a dynamic constitutional moment, an evolving view of a changing view, right, of the way we conceive of the constitutional right? Is it, or is it just, you know, the otherwise, where's the animus coming from? Why now? You know, what can justify sort of the recent or growing sudden appearance of it. And the second part of my question, you can choose to answer whichever part of this you like, um, is about empirics, because both of your arguments seem to have some, put some faith in the ability of empirical work to lay the groundwork for the kind of uh, resolution you'd like to see, or the kind of movement you'd like to see. And I wonder if you really have faith um, after these years of debate uh, in empirics and laying the groundwork for the kind of regulation uh, that you'd like to see. Who would like to go first with that? Um, well, I, could, I, I mean, unless, Jake, you want to jump in. Um, so as to, the, um, as to the first question, like what's going on with the courts, um, I, 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 Glenn Reynolds and I wrote an article after the Lopez decision years and years ago. And, you know, after Lopez was decided, the first uh, law struck down under the Commerce Clause in 60 years. And we were sort of curious about what was going on in the lower courts. And the answer was nothing. <laughs> and so I learned a very valuable lesson from reading all of those cases, you know, between Morrison, uh, I mean, between Lopez and then, and then Morrison, that five-year stretch. But what I learned was that lower courts have a tremendous uh, have tremendous discretion in implementing Supreme Court decisions. And that also lower courts, particularly courts of appeals, are sort of small c conservative. So any, any Supreme Court decision that is potentially disruptive, uh, they are going to treat very uh, cautiously, unless they're trying to make a point and are trying to be uncivilly obedient. That's a separate question. Uh, then they sort of we'll try to force the court's hand to either explain what it meant or, or walk it back. And so I just, I think that, that the lack of movement, I mean, the Ninth Circuit's uh, gambit appears to be that anytime you get a three judge panel that overturns a law on, on Second Amendment grounds, they're gonna immediately rehear it on Bonk and reverse the, the, the three judge panel. And right now the Supreme Court is not sending any signals to the lower courts that they need to take it more seriously. Um, and so that dynamic is something that I find very fascinating. Um, and so I think that's, Supreme Court isn't very interested. The, the, you know, the one case that they grant cert on is this weird New York case that gets mooted 
and there just doesn't appear to be any appetite for um, more clearly marking out the meets and bounds. And so I think that's, and then the lower courts are just sort of naturally like, look, we don't rock the boat here. Um, as far as the second and empirics, no, I have no faith in empirics to, to um, I think that this goes to uh, people's can't helps. Um, I think that uh, Dan Kahan and Don Brayman have it right that these are, are deeply ingrained aspects of our personality. And if you are oriented a certain way, uh, no amount of empirics are going to convince you that, uh, you know, must carry laws are a good thing. If you're oriented the other way, no set of empirics are going to convince you that assault weapons bans are, are useful. Except that your proposal in part relies on Congress making a record. So doesn't that require some faith in empirics? Well, it, requ it requires Congress to make a record that'll satisfy the court, which I think is a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> on that note, Jake. Yeah, so I, I don't think that Brandon and I probably disagree on a whole lot, A, about the question of whether and where these claims are coming from. And so I think he's absolutely right that the kind of the genesis for the claims is two, two things. One that Reeve has written about before in this movement leading up to Heller of a really expansive view of the Second Amendment and gun rights. And then the culmination in Heller and that it was seen as a watershed moment and a sea change. And so there was an expectation that following Heller, there would be a lot of laws that would fall. Um, and when that didn't come true, what's the natural explanation? One explanation is um, there just have not been a lot of stringent gun laws recently that states were already loosening their gun laws before Heller and, and um, at the same time as Heller. And so there just weren't things to strike down. The other explanation is that courts are just defying Heller, right? Um, or that legislators are getting away with um, restricting the rights in ways that the Second Amendment shouldn't or wouldn't allow if courts were policing it better. And so Brandon and I might disagree about which of those interpretations is correct, but I think that's why we see these claims coming up now is because there is this expectation that, um, that, that Heller or a proper understood Second Amendment should be protecting the right more strongly than lower courts are doing, um, and that legislators are getting away with things that they shouldn't um, or wouldn't if courts were more closely policing it. Um, in terms of empirics, so I will half agree with Brandon, I guess, that um, putting faith in judges' ability to look at empirical evidence and determine, you know, how closely a law is related to a certain end is, is of course, going to be dependent on some set of pre-existing um, beliefs about how closely we should, or how much we should defer to legislators, what kind of good faith they're using when they're compiling these statistics, um, what what the what the availability of statistics looks like. A couple ways out of that. One would be the way that Joseph and Reaver are talking about, which is that we don't need as close a, or, or we shouldn't at least singularly look to statistics and empirics to justify gun regulations, where we have good evidence that. Um, other interests or other rights are being uh, harmed by certain gun laws or, or certain gun carry or possession. Um, and, and, and the second is just that, what's the alternative? So I, I don't have more faith in judges' ability to mine through a historical record, say, and figure out whether text history and tradition is going to show us that a certain gun law is or is not constitutional than I have in their ability to look at a set of um, you know, competing expert reports and, and say whose is, is more compelling. Nor, to the point of my paper, do I have more faith in judges to look at the purposes underlying a law and the subjective intent of the legislators and say, well, they were actually motivated by their hatred for the Second Amendment, so therefore this, this law shouldn't stand. So none, none of the systems are perfect. Um, I think that means we shouldn't kick out the empirics. I also think it means we shouldn't rely on the empirics alone. Um, but I also think that means there has to be um, a healthy dose of deference to the um, democratically legislative, democratically elected branches.
Okay, so I'm going to try to get through uh, a bunch of these questions in the chat. I'm going to combine a couple of them. Um, there are a couple for Nelson uh, that basically go to the point of uh, any kind of response to what Reva said, and also specifically referencing a recent Ninth Circuit opinion uh, in which Judge Lee suggested that minority distrust of law enforcement uh, is a reason to justify broad gun, light, gun rights. So in other words, uh, does Black Lives Matter have an argument that minority communities should police themselves like the Black Panthers did in the 1960s? Okay, so Reva made a, a number of points. I don't know if you want me to try to respond to all of them. I probably can't do that. I don't that. think we have time, so I'll just keep pick one or two that you'd right. like to respond. Um, but before, before I do that, I do want to make one response to, to what Joseph said at the beginning of his uh, remarks. And I think we were kind of orthogonal in our answer to the question of does it make a difference. Uh, I answered the question, tried to answer the question of how likely it is that we can change people's minds who disagree with us. Um, but the other question, what he responded to, is will it make a difference in the adjudication of cases, depending on which side of kind of the debate between us you're on? And there, I think that's certainly true. There's a lot of cases we'll agree, end up agreeing about, but there are a lot of cases on, at the margin where it's going to make a difference, uh, which, 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 which you take. Um, now, um, with respond to, uh, uh, I think maybe one of the biggest um points i want to make about reva's comments is she asks who's going to decide uh the democratic process of the courts and i think inevitably the courts are going to decide they are just going to decide now they may decide uh, as many of them now do to give a great deal of deference to legislative choices uh, but the courts will 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 decide um, and she said, well, should due weight be given to, to, to the legislatures? Well, sure. The <laughs> whole question is what's due weight? Um, and and, and that's, that's where I think uh, uh, we dis disagree. Um, the, the, the question about carrying a gun in, in a such a way that it intimidates, I mean, courts inevitably are gonna have to decide, well, what is a, is, would a reasonable person be intimidated by, by, by this form of carrying? And uh, again, we could probably disagree about what a reasonable person would, would think. Courts are going to have to decide that. I think inevitably they're going to have to use some kind of reasonableness standard. Um, I will just say that I'm quite uncomfortable when I have to be in a gun-free zone. Um, and uh, it's it partly uncomfortable because of the fact that I'm unarmed, because I obey the law, um, and partly because uh, I'm, I'm aware that there will not be other people like me who are armed. Um, and therefore, if, uh, if this gun-free zone is attacked by, uh, by, by criminals and terrorists and so on, as has happened many times, there's nobody, there's nobody to, to defend it. So I'm uncomfortable. Does that, mean, does that necessarily mean my position should prevail on the interpretation of the Second Amendment? Uh, no, uh, I, I don't think that my discomfort should be determinative. But similarly, I don't think the discomfort of people on the other side of that kind of perception uh, should prevail. Uh, one more thing about the McCloskey case in St. Louis. Uh, I have not followed that very closely. Um, so I don't know if the prosecution uh, of those people is justified or not. Um, when you, you know, watch the talking heads on television, you hear a lot of different opinions about that. Uh, I, I hope that the legal process will work properly and the, the end result will be the correct one. I don't know that that will be the case, but I'm not prepared to prejudge uh, the outcome of that case or of uh, any of the other cases uh, that, that have not been through the judicial process, including uh, some of these cases about uh, allegations made against police officers. Um, I'm just not gonna prejudge any of those cases. Great. Uh, Joe and Reva, we have a question for you um, that uh, conceptualizes what you're doing uh, as criminalizing risk creation uh, as opposed to this actual physical harm and asks whether you're worried about whether that's going to expand enforcement discretion uh, in ways that could be counterproductive. So I'll say a few words and then I'll let Joseph jump in. I, partly what we're doing is showing people what we already are doing now, just drawing attention to the world that we're in. Um, 
we do have a world in which we have brandishing laws. So we already have a world in which gun laws are enforced in a way that protect these interests. But we talk about the world we're in and we talk about gun laws in a language that focuses on physical harms. And part of our concern is to draw attention to the social dimensions and the constitutional um, dimensions of the, or stakes of the ways that we enforce our gun laws um, because we need to have the conversations that we're having on this panel. And it's valuable for us to be having the dialogue that we're having with Nelson because of the place that we're at nationally right now. Um, we don't agree. And the stakes are very high. And Nelson's and my intuitions about this are not the same, if you couldn't guess. Um, but I do think it's important that we actually start to understand that we have different intu intuitions, that we see different things about what happened this summer, that we have a different idea about gun laws and about what it means even handily to enforce them, and start being mindful of all of that. Um, and that we get the institutions that we have that are responsible for enacting, for enforcing, and for ensuring the constitutional vindication of these laws, get very self-conscious about what's going down here. And that doesn't just mean because some people have Second Amendment rights, but because we live in a constitutional democracy in which many constitutional rights are at stake in the enforcement of these laws. CEG Whitmer, CEG, the racialized dimensions of all of these disputes. And so what I would say to the, I think it was Alice who put that question in the feed, but I was trying very hard to listen to everything Nelson was saying. So I didn't want to start writing because I needed to listen to what Nelson was saying. Um, I'm not calling at every point for, we're not calling for more laws. Um, we are calling for awareness about the ways the laws we have are being enforced. I don't think for a minute we can just sort of catapult ourselves or our society out of racial injustice. That's not just about to happen, but we can be mindful and intentional about the ways the laws we have are being enforced. And this is a call for that. Great. I'm going to jump in, Joseph, if you don't mind, with one last question for the Senator. Um, I'm going to combine two questions. We have a federalism line of questions here, okay? And so um, one of these from Sandy Levinson goes to the idea that, does anyone really take seriously Frank Easterbrook's opinion in McDonald that conservative respect for federalism and local decision-making should have any weight at all? And then there's another federalism question similarly that asks about the May issue statutes uh, which empower local law enforcement to deny permits or grant them um, and is asking how that could ever be narrowly tailored under intermediate scrutiny. Sole discretion to local law enforcement, how could that ever pass intermediate scrutiny? I think I would like to you know, invite, you know, Brandon, you haven't a chance to respond about to just the federalism since your argument also goes into, people have also asked several questions, Brandon, about you and Shelby County, you know, the idea that different states might have uh, different uh, different regimes have. So I just, we all invite you to talk about federalism by way of closing us out. Okay. Um, yeah, I've got it. The Shelby County case is, is something that I've got to wrestle with. Um, I, I don't know. Part of me thinks that might've been one of those uh, good for one day and one train only type decisions. <laughs> I hate to say it. Maybe that makes me sound too cynical. Um, as to Sandy's point, I mean, you know, I mean, I thought that the ship had sailed on the localism and federalism when it came to constitutional rights. I mean, you know, we, I thought we, we answered that question years ago and, and why the Second Amendment should be different. Uh, you know, there is a kind of Second Amendment exceptionalism. Um, I mean, I'm not the first person to, to approach this Section 5 question. Uh, Bill Ariza wrote a great piece in uh, the Washington and Lee Law Review about this, but he concluded that basically you've got to throw out uh, congruence and proportionality when it comes to the Second Amendment because it doesn't work very well. You need a finer grain analysis. And, and at every turn, it seems uh, you're met with arguments that, well, the Second Amendment is different. But 
it either is or it isn't. I mean, it, 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 I don't know why all the arguments about why local and state responses to Second Amendment issues need to be tailored don't also apply to the First Amendment um, or the, you know, the Fourth Amendment. And I just, I, you know, that way lies madness, I think. You know, it's either, a, it's either part of the Bill of Rights or it's not. And uh, I think there have been uh, too many instances where courts and others have applied, say, intermediate scrutiny in a way that it wouldn't be applied in a First Amendment case involving uh, content neutral regulations. Um, and I've just read too many of those cases to conclude otherwise, that there's something else going on there. But having said that, I will say that I completely agree with, with what Reva said, that it's very important, and I, I want to, you know, salute uh, uh, Jake and Joseph and, and Daryl for creating space where you can have these dialogues uh, because, and I appreciate Joseph <clears throat> and Reva both taking the step to emphasize commonality, uh, if only to um, highlight the places where we differ and maybe have those uh, conversations uh, a, a bit more productively. What a wonderful comment to end on. Um, let's give a virtual round of applause to our terrific panelists. Um, I understand we have maybe like three or four minutes and then we are going to hear from Senator Murphy. I don't know if uh, anyone wants me to say anything other than that or Joseph just come back in three minutes. Does that sound, that sounds correct. Come back in three minutes, everybody. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, if everyone could just come back um, in, in three minutes, uh, that would be great. Um, thank you all to the panelists and to Professor Gluck uh, for a wonderful panel. Thank you so much. See you. Thank you.